Hi, I'm Talon Bentley. This is uh, a little bit out of my normal area of geologizing, but uh, I happen to find myself today on Oahu in the Hawaiian archipelago, and I've climbed up a, a small volcano here called Diamond Head. I'd like to explore the geology of Diamond Head in this video. So this is the summit of Diamond Head, the highest point on the rim of the crater. And you can get a panorama here of the entire crater here behind me. So sometime in the past half a million years, which is a relatively young age for uh, the middle part of the Hawaiian archipelago, that we had a, a, a eruption here that basically put out a bunch of pyroclastics, a bunch of ash and lapilli, blocks and bombs, and it built up in this layered structure called a tuff cone. Okay, so um, if this doesn't look like your typical volcano, that's because Diamond Head was tunneled into and fortified during World War II as a defensive position uh, to guard this American soil from um, Japanese invasion. This is, of course, the same island that hosts Pearl Harbor and the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor was the event that precipitated the entry of the United States into World War II. So it's kind of neat because you get some geology here, but there's also this sense of human history um, that's kind of baked into the place as well. So it's kind of a, a palimpsest history, two, two histories for the price of one. <laughs> Really cool. So Diamond Head is uh, not a volcano that is um, built by lava flows. Instead, this is a spot where a bunch of pyroclastic material was erupted. So by pyroclastic material, I mean solid chunks of rock. And some of those solid chunks are big, and some of those solid chunks are medium, and some of those solid chunks are really small. But you can see here a distinct stratification to the volcano. These are layers of ash and larger particles that were laid down in this eruption. And in many places, it's kind of weathered, takes on an appearance like this. But here and there, there are fresh surfaces that show us interesting aspects to the eruptive history. So right here, you can see a really big chunk. And this big chunk has actually deformed the strata that were there before it was erupted. So this is an example of a volcanic bomb. So uh, a large particle of rock that was thrown out of the volcano and then it landed and squished down onto the pre-existing uh, ash layers. Some people would say this isn't a bomb in the strict sense of the word, but uh, a volcanic block instead, because it didn't leave the volcano as a liquid droplet, all right? It was shot out as a solid chunk. Uh, this is a beautiful bomb sag here. So here's a little chunk of vesicular basalt, and that vesicular basalt has pierced through the pre-existing sedimentary strata here. So you can see like this ashy layer basically just wraps around it just like that. Isn't that wild? It's funny, you know, a, uh, a sedimentary geologist would feel very at home hiking Diamond Head because you see all these beautiful primary sedimentary structures. So look at this here. There's a, a nice contact here where you've got the base of one bed and then it truncates a pre-existing bed. So you've actually got some erosion of the ash layers before they were lithified and then new ash layers filling in that uh, erosional cavity. So here's an example of a primary sedimentary structure that we see in these volcanic ash deposits. So right here between my two fingers is an example of a reverse graded bed. A graded bed where the uh, fine stuff is at the bottom and coarse stuff is at the top. And this probably indicates a very turbulent mixture of ash and gas and um, the uh, heavy particles actually rode to the top as smaller particles sifted underneath them. <laughs> so reverse graded beds are something that we often see associated with debris flows and um, uh, potentially things like volcanic lahars, but this seems to be one that formed in a gaseous mixture of particles and, um, and gas. You know, as a structural geologist, I can't help but look for patterns that indicate deformation and I'm lucky because I found one. 
So right here, we've got this nice trio of fairly fine ash beds that are kind of a brown color. And then in between them, there are some lighter colored layers. And uh, right here, we can see that there's uh, an offset in those layers, which seems to indicate a very small offset normal fault, essentially dropping one side down relative to the other. So if you look at this surface here, you'll see something new and different. You see a reddish color. And that reddish color, I think, is coming from steam and other hot gases that are being released by deeper ash layers. And then they're being vented up along cracks, essentially to form fumaroles at the surface after the ash was erupted. And those hot gases end up altering the ash on either side of the fracture and staining it a bright red. The high temperature provides the energy to run chemical reactions, including oxidation reactions. So here is a look at what these things look like in cross section. So this is a flat surface that's red with some, some white stuff on it that looks very much like the surface I was just showing you. And then you can see how it extends upward through the outcrop there. And there's really a zone of alteration on either side of the fracture. So I think that we're looking there at a little bit of the, the vent plumbing that was allowing gases to escape from earlier phases of the eruption. So here we're looking at uh, some white planar surfaces. And these planar surfaces are joints that have been mineralized. So we could call these veins. And if we uh, drop a little bit of hydrochloric acid onto this white material, you can see that it vigorously fizzes. And so therefore that is calcite. And if you're wondering how you get calcite out of rocks like these, you know, the answer is in these basaltic chunks that make up a lot of the, uh, the fragments here. These basaltic chunks are rich in the mineral plagioclase, and that plagioclase is uh, a mineral that includes the element calcium. So you've got one of the ingredients to make calcite right there in the rock. The other ingredient actually comes from the sky. So as rainwater falls on Diamond Head, it picks up a little bit of carbon dioxide as it falls through the atmosphere. And rainwater actually is a weakly acidic solution. It's a carbonic acid. So that goes down through these fractures in the rock and the carbon dioxide in the rainwater ends up interacting with the calcium from the rock and you end up forming calcite. So in a way, this is a natural form of carbon sequestration, right? Taking mafic rocks and then weathering them in a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere. So it's uh, mimicking this is one of the strategies that's being employed or at least being considered to, to be deployed as a, a strategy for bringing down global CO2 levels. Okay. So in this layer here, a pretty coarse layer, you can see it's, it's relatively thin over here, it's relatively thin over here, but here it suddenly gets very thick. This seems to be an erosional channel that was cut into earlier ash layers and then uh, subsequent ash layers filled in that channel. Okay. So here we've got our pyroclastic stratification going almost horizontally. But then you can see there's this very densely spaced set of fractures that uh, go through those layers at various angles. And um, I think what's going on here is we have some uh, contraction of the rocks, some cooling of the rocks, and they shrink a bit. And as they shrink a bit, they pull apart from one another, and that opens up these fractures. This is something that we see very regularly in basalt lava flows. When they cool, they contract, and you end up getting columnar jointing, such as at Devil's Tower or the Giant's Causeway, uh, and plenty of other locations here in Hawaii. So when the volcano here was erupting this pyroclastic material, it was shooting forth pulses of ash and gas under various energy levels. And we can actually read the variation in energy levels by looking at grain size. Larger particles take more energy to move and therefore represent a more energetic phase of the eruption. Finer particles will only settle out under relatively low energy conditions and therefore represent a time of relatively low energy during the eruption. Still energetic enough to blast out sand sized particles, but um, not so energetic that they can't settle at the same time. So you're basically looking here at evidence of you know, high energy, low, 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 over and over and over again, as the volcano was pulsing out this material rapidly through time. Okay, so this is uh, an example of a breccia here. Um, breccias are uh, very charismatic looking rocks. They uh, are poorly sorted mixtures of really angular fragments. 
And this one's kind of cool because it's really high contrast. So you've got these chunks of uh, brownish rock, and in some cases kind of reddish, and then they're cemented together with this white cement. And that's, again, a calcite cement, like we saw up above in terms of uh, the weathering product that's um, being produced when carbon dioxide and um, calcium-rich plagioclase interact. Well, I hope you've enjoyed taking this hike with me up to the top of Diamond Head and learning a little bit about its volcanic history.